You're listening to episode 67 of the Product Boss Podcast. In this episode, we are joined with Natalie Ekdahl. Natalie is our mentor, friend, encourager, leader, and just so many things. Natalie Ekdahl is a business strategist and high-performance coach that helps women across the globe build, grow, and scale their businesses. She's also the mom of three kiddos, and she's actually worked with both of us, Mina and I, and um, directly into our businesses. She's the founder of the Biz Chicks community and host of the Biz Chicks podcast. Natalie is also the person that made me fall in love with podcasts years ago. I actually discovered Natalie during a really hard time. I chatted about it on her podcast in episode 333, which I'll link in the show notes. But it was when I was in the hospital with my daughter. She had had emergency open heart surgery and we had an extended stay at the hospital. So I remember Natalie's voice being there in such a traumatic and horrible time in my life. And I'm so appreciative of her podcast because it helped me to feel less isolated and less alone during this time. And so, if you guys want to hear more about that story, <laughs> jump on to that episode with Natalie on the Bishops podcast. Yeah. So thank you so much, Natalie, for putting yourself out there into the world. So not only that, but I don't know if you guys know this, but Natalie is the person that introduced Mina and myself. Um, yes, the two hosts of this podcast. We were brought together by Natalie Ekdahl, be it listening to her podcast in the community. And um, Natalie thought that we would be a good fit since I was a product entrepreneur and Mina was an Amazon expert. And cut to many Voxers later, <laughs> we launched um, a business together and, and this. And so this would not have happened without Natalie playing this really big role in our lives. And we can't wait for you to get to know her more. So Natalie's just come out with a book, which we talk about in this episode, and it's called Reset Your Mindset. And it really helps entrepreneurs tackle those mindset struggles to come that come with building your business. And guess what, guys? I'm actually in one of the chapters where she talks about it. And in the episode throughout, anytime that Jacqueline's mentioned, she says, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Which is amazing. Well, this is just a fun conversation with Natalie. We know you will, guys will love her just as much as we do. So let's get started. Woo woo. <laughs> Welcome to the Product Boss Podcast, where we help product based businesses grow their sales and improve their strategies. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to my co host and biz bestie. Mina Kunlo Sitap, an Amazon guru that has built a multi six figure product based business. In introducing the other half of the product boss, Jacqueline Snyder, she has helped launch and grow over 500 fashion apparel and accessory brands, even one of her own. And together, we share our inventory of secret weapons that will help you dig deep and do the work it takes. Are you ready? Let's build together. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Product Boss Podcast. I'm your host, Jacqueline Snyder, with my beautiful co-host, Mina kunlo Sitep. Hey, Mina. Hey, Jacqueline. So, guys, we are so excited. If you <laughs> listen to this podcast, you know that we are huge fans of this woman and her podcast. We have Natalie Ekdahl of the Biz Chicks Podcast on. Hey, Natalie. Hi, ladies. I'm so excited to be here. We're so excited that you're here. If you listen to our podcast at all, she's always on every episode anyway. So <laughs> this time we have her talking. Yeah, it actually ruins my day uh, <laughs> if I'm listening to you and you don't mention me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we will be sure to mention you every episode. Um, <laughs> but it's such an honor. I, get, I actually get a little excited. It's fun to hear your name on the radio. Mm -hmm. I know it's, um, it's exciting. And thank you because Mina has been on your podcast and we're just so honored that you are here with us today. Um, so if you guys don't know who Natalie Ekdahl is based on listening to our podcast, we are going to introduce you to her. So like I said, she's the host of the Biz Chicks podcast, and now she is an author of the book, Reset Your Mindset. So exciting. So Natalie, tell us a little bit about, um, your background. So your entrepreneurial journey, like how it began and how you ended up as a huge podcaster and an author. Well, uh, I have a pretty deep business background. I worked in corporate America and I have an MBA. And so that kind of education coupled with my work experience um, 
has been really influential in helping entrepreneurs add some of that structure and um, kind of deep thinking in my MBA. I really learned a lot about critical thinking and how to analyze a business and how to analyze other businesses. So I feel like that really helps and, and informs the coaching that I do. I, uh, I actually started my entrepreneurial career at, uh, well, there's several ventures from being younger, but my first real business was a swimming instructor. So I haven't told many people about that, but I was a private swimming instructor uh, when I was in high school and college. And uh, I actually realized a lot of the lessons learned from that business I incorporate today. I'm like, that's a, I need to do a podcast episode on that. Uh, so uh, learning how to work with clients, learning how to have repeat clients, that was uh, a lot of my lessons learned from that business. Uh, but most of my work experience is in corporate America, as I said, and as a management consultant. So we actually would travel to different uh, locations wherever the client was and uh, help them with whatever project or issue they had. I worked on a lot of like mergers and acquisitions. So I have experience working with a lot of different types of companies. And uh, my husband and I had our own business. We launched a software uh, company together, which I think helps me understand product entrepreneurs more than say someone who hasn't had, like I haven't had a product business, but we did have a uh, software as a service uh, business. And a lot of the issues are similar with uh, selling a product. Uh, we didn't have inventory <laughs> like you guys have, uh, but we had a lot of investment in the software and which is similar to product entrepreneurs investing in their inventory <laughs> and having to move their inventory. So, uh, while having that company, we were trying to learn everything we could about uh, starting and running a business and uh, having team members. And it was so different from uh, what we did in, in our corporate work. And we turned to audiobooks and podcasts to learn, which many of us do, right? That's how we're, we're trying to educate ourselves and learn. And at the time, and this is going back to like, uh, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013, I could not find podcasts for women entrepreneurs, which seems crazy now. We're recording this uh, end of 2018. There's so many, right? <laughs> you search women yeah. entrepreneur in, uh, but I would search and not find anything or I would find things with terrible audio quality and not the information I was looking for. So all the entrepreneurial podcasts at the time were men, mainly interviewing other men. And they were often like millennial men interviewing other millennial men, like, um, 25 to 30 year old dudes talking to other single dudes. And that just did not fit my life. Like I didn't relate to them. Like they talk about having this huge, like hour long morning routine. Uh, anyone who's a mom knows that you probably don't get an hour long morning routine uh, unless you're getting up super early or your kids are leaving and you're doing something after that. So long story short, I decided to start a podcast uh, at the end of 2013 and launched it in January, 2014, which brings us to here. But you are a product person now, Natalie. You have your book no. and you have the Biz Chicks Bible, which is a physical binder that we get every year at Biz Chicks Live. So yes. those are two physical things that you sell that could, you could definitely scale. Yes. These two have been pressuring me to become product, <laughs> product entrepreneur. And I know how hard it is. So I'm really careful. And I'm also careful about creating too much complexity in my business because I'm a proponent of keeping things as simple as possible. Uh, but you guys are who I turn, who I do turn to and will turn to when I, I, I envision other products, you know, and we've talked about this separately offline. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity, you know, having a brand and uh, having people that identify as a community and providing products for them. So that's definitely in our future, but I'm slow. I'm slow to launch that even though I'm a quick start. Like I have a lot of ideas and I implement a lot of them. <laughs> Well, we're always mean and I always just get so excited because we participate in the events. We're like, what if? <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of opportunity. I'm excited to see how that unfolds throughout, uh, throughout the years because I think we're all in this for the long term. Yeah. So you are, um, again, so you're a mom of three kids and yes. a wife and a business owner with multiple sort of deliverables, right? So the podcast, the book, you, have, you do coaching, masturbating, all that. So how do you keep your head on straight. That's a big question we get from people all the time. How do you do all the things? And we kind of give our opinion on what they should do. But now that you've actually added a level, let's say to your business, um, what do you, what would your day look like or how do you keep your head on? 
So I have a lot of help at this point and I didn't always have this much help. So my head was a little crazier a few years ago. In fact, I, ha- I let a lot of things go. And I think that I see women trying to be 100% at everything, like trying to be PTA president. Like I could be PTA president. I would be amazing at it, right? I could like lead that whole school. I could lead all the volunteers. We know everybody's roles and responsibilities. I could run the meetings and be so professional. But I choose not to do that. That is not what I am meant to be doing right now. And so I am very careful what volunteer responsibilities I accept. I am careful about what family parties I volunteer to host. So I used to always host Christmas Eve. And a few years ago, I told my mom, probably like three years ago, I said, Mom, I I need you to take this party back. (laughs) I can't do it this year. And I haven't done it for a few years. And actually, my mom's here today. And I was just, we were just reflecting on like, I'm now ready, like I'm hosting it this year. And I'm ready to do that because I have a lot more stability. I have more help on my on my biz chicks team and I have more help in my home. And so that is how I'm able to do it. But I was, I was, I allowed myself to have, I would call it minimum viable Natalie. So you might have heard the term minimum viable product. And that's, I, I know you guys have talked about it on, on air before, which is uh, getting something that's good enough that you can just get out into the marketplace and, and test. And so I've just allowed myself to be minimum viable Natalie for a few years because building biz chicks was taking so much of my time and energy and I needed that. And so I had to sacrifice on the personal front on a few levels. And some of that has been helping at school. Some of that has been um, not remembering every single person's birthday in my life. Some of that has been uh, not sending out holiday cards for a few years. So anything I could strip away and I focused on what was most important, which is my children and my husband and the business. And other things beyond that, I had to just let them not happen or not be perfect. I love that so much. MVN. So tell us a little bit about why you decided to write a book. That's such a good question. I feel like my mom brainwashed me to have to write a book at some point. (laughs) So my mom, my mom's actually very entrepreneurial and she is an incredible salesperson. Uh, In fact, I should figure out how to get her to sell uh, my masterminds for me and my coaching for me. Uh, she's just so uh, like a natural salesperson. And she always shared that, you know, in her mind, books made a lot of money. It was a way to make a living. And a lot of author- authors do that, but not, I would say like maybe five to 10% of all authors do that. But the majority, we write a book and it's not our source of income. Uh, so that's kind of a seed that was planted my whole life. And on my bucket list was to write a book. And then I knew I wanted to write a book. It's been like festering in me that that would be an amazing thing to have out there. Uh, The book that came out is not the book that I thought I would write. So I thought I was going to write something more on like the secrets of my six figure uh, clients, which is a episode I've done in the past and it's very popular. And I knew I could unpack that and that be of interest to a lot of people in my audience. But at Biz Chicks Live 2017, which is a live event I host for women entrepreneurs in Southern California, and you have both attended the last two years we've hosted it. And uh, at that event, I did a talk on mindset, which was meant to be like a short 30-minute talk, and it went actually an hour. And it was going so well that my team didn't stop me. So I had no idea like what the clock was. I didn't know I had gone over our schedule, and we had to rework some of the schedule that day. What happened in that room made me realize that there was a need for a book on mindset. And I've seen what I cover in the book. I've seen parts of it in different places, but I've never seen a book that one had a framework for you to work through like on your own, because I feel like so much mindset, so many mindset issues are internal and then chapters on specific mindset topics, because sometimes you just are dealing with this one thing and just want to like get some support. And so I wanted it to be a book on its, that would stand alone on its own, but also in the future for people, a reference guide where they could go back and check on it, check on, check in and, and learn and support themselves. So, um, I am in the book. It's Jacqueline. <laughs> yeah. Um, so woohoo. No. So, um, I work with Natalie and obviously me and I are huge fans. And so, um, you, I had the honor of being interviewed by you to be in the book and I talk about scarcity and we, yes. we did an episode on our money mindsets and um, I worked with Natalie a lot on my mindset of scarcity. And so I'm glad I could sort of help out other people who feel the same way. I think that your story is so powerful, Jacqueline. And 
I think it's especially powerful when you are vulnerable and share, uh, you know, so many people admire you. And so for you to be vulnerable and share where that comes from, and it's, it's something that, uh, you know, comes up for you a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's kind of where you, your, your home base, right? You like retreat to scarcity. I do too. I share my scarcity, um, stories in the book as well. And, uh, it's something I fight as well. So it's, that's the thing about mindset, right? You don't conquer it. You have to, that's why I call it reset because you have to keep resetting yourself. And it's so frustrating like for you and for me, but I, you know, you've shared so much with me in, in our work together. It's so frustrating because we are doing so great and then something happens which takes us to that dark spot that that normal place where that place of like primal fear and we need to have tools to get out of it and so i was so so thank you so much by the way for sharing your story in the book because it's uh, it's a i i've already heard from people that you're inspiring other people oh thanks yeah i mean it's hard i mean and that's the thing you don't even realize sometimes unless you're going to a therapist and unpacking and when i hired natalie as a business coach did I know that I was going to work on mindset? No, <laughs> not at all. But you are very intuitive with things and you're, and you're able to see kind of past someone saying something like we just got off a call with some of our um, office hours and the masterminders and, and somebody had prefaced like we are running out of money and, and it's always about money as well. And so you're starting to see how they need to dig in a little bit into their numbers and, and seeing, and what is the story behind it? So let's talk about the reset framework that you work on because I use it in my life. So, um, and then, and since I've worked with you and so you talk about recognize, evaluate your story enough and take actions. So do you want to explain that a little bit more to our listeners? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the first thing is just to realize that you're having a mindset issue. And I say, would you figure that out to celebrate? It feels like, oh, yay, I know I'm having a mindset issue, but I've worked with so many women that are not aware that they are having a mindset issue or that they have mindset issues. So just putting names to things is so helpful. So once you have like read the book and you realize, oh, I have, I'm feeling fear of success. Like I'm not able to move forward because I'm afraid of how this could impact my life. Like what if it's wildly successful? So then you don't do it or fear of failure or imposter syndrome or money mindset, whatever you're dealing with, uh, just recognizing, okay. And like for you, Jacqueline, what you're saying, like to know, okay, I'm dealing with scarcity right now. This is, um, where do I go from here? And so then you start to evaluate, okay, why am I feeling scarcity? For example, where is that coming from? Why is this triggering that scarcity feeling with, within me? And that's kind of that evaluate step. And then to hear what stories you're telling yourself about it. And I, um, I borrowed this concept from Brene Brown in Rising Strong. It's an amazing book. She shared that we're all telling ourselves stories and of course, we all know we're telling ourselves stories, but we may not have like realized that. So we create stories for other people uh, in our business. And so uh, like Jacqueline, for example, you know, you've shared that, you know, sometimes if, if a client doesn't get back to you right away or if a client, um, you know, say, say you have a, you and I both do sales calls. We all do, right? We all do sales calls. And sometimes you have some that are going really great and they're, everyone's, you know, saying yes. And then you have a couple of the people that say no. And for those of us that struggle with scarcity, it can take us to a really dark place. And so we have to be careful what story we're telling ourselves about the other person that we're, you know, we're making up things for other people in our head. And so to understand what that story is, and then really the only way to move, move past uh, what you're going through in your head is just to decide that you're done with it. Like, this is enough. I'm done with this. And sometimes for me, I have to, like, especially with things that are really big. So putting on a large event like Biz Chicks Live, I have to do a lot of mindset work in order to do that. Writing this book, actually, I had mindset issues around writing a book about mindset. I had times where like I was paralyzed and could not move forward with writing the content. And at the end of the day, you have to decide if you could survive whatever it is you're worried about. And so you have to unpack all of the things. And so I call this the what if protocol. So you start saying, well, what if this happened? And what if that happened? Because we'll, we tend to, from working with a lot of women, what I find is they stop at the first one. Well, what if this thing happened? I'm scared that this could happen. And so one of the ways that I've helped people is I say, what if it does, what would you do? And then they say, well, then I would do this but then that they're worried about something else. And so we keep going until we've assessed all the worries and impact them all. And then at the end, it really is 
could you live through it? Could you survive if all those things you're worried about happened? Could you survive it? And then you get to like, yes, I could live. And so now I'm ready to take some action. So, um, for example, for my, my live event, you know, what if people hate it? This is, I'll just share what happens in my head. Okay. What if I do this? What if no one buys tickets? So what if I host this, I offer this event to the world and no one buys tickets. Okay. Could I live through that? I could, but then what if people buy tickets, but then, um, they get there and they hate it. Could I survive that? Like what if they blast on social media that it was the worst event they've ever been to? Could I live through that? I had to decide that I could in order to put the event on. And so then you start doing things to take action and taking action could just be like one thing, sending an email, calling one person, sending an invoice, doing one tiny piece of forward momentum. And then it's that point of action that helps you start to get out of the mindset, uh, the scary mindset issue you're dealing with and to move forward. Yeah, I think we all tell ourselves such crazy stories and that's with every aspect of our life, you know, whether in business or family or these people are thinking this and these other mothers are doing such great things and I'm not doing enough, all these crazy stories. Um, I do think that it's so powerful that you decided to roll out a book to address all this stuff because I think you had mentioned this very a long time ago. You probably have to go dig in your podcast episodes that people tend not, not to pay for mindset work. They don't. You have to think about in anything we're doing and even in selling product, right? What are people willing to pay for? Just because you want to offer something doesn't mean people are going to pay for it. Or just because you have this really cool product that you like doesn't mean anyone's going to buy it. And it's the same with you know offering a service to the marketplace. So I know that every woman I work with has mindset issues and needs to work on them because people usually come to me because they're trying to do something new and trying to up level what they're doing. And there's mindset associated with that within that. Uh, so I don't sell that I'm a mindset coach. There are some people that do, and I think it's, it's a little more difficult than some of the, what I offer to the world so that I, I like to say, uh, what, what you sell may not be exactly what you deliver. And I don't always know what mindset issues we're going to talk about, but I, I know it's going to come up every time. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, it, it is nice to have the book out there. I wanted to, you know, you asked me earlier, Mina, like, why did I choose to write this book? I also want, I feel like part of my role in this world is to let everyone know we're not alone. All the women entrepreneurs out there and really women in general, we are all thinking and feeling so many things. And because of the intimacy of the type of work I do with people through coaching and masterminds, they share a lot of very personal things with me. And so I just wanted to normalize the experience. We are all feeling this, but we're not talking about it. So by sharing, you know, other women's stories in the book, I think that it's helping the people that are reading it really feel like, okay, I'm not alone. Like other people are going through this. I thought it was just me. And even giving a name to something like the word imposter syndrome, feeling like you're a fraud or that people are going to find out that you're a fraud. I remember when I first learned that term, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I thought it was just me. I thought other people felt this way. And to have, and then to call it something like, if, I feel like it gives you power and helps you not get stuck. Yeah. I love this one um, sheet. It's one of the pages in the Biz Chicks Bible, which is again, the three ring binder we get at Biz Chicks Live. And it shows all these things that you can do when you get stuck. Mm -hmm. And this is something that happens a lot for our creative entrepreneur minds, right? Is the, we get stuck, we have the, all that self-doubt and then we don't know how to get out of it. And you give us like all these little boxes of things that we can do. Can you talk a little bit more about just taking action to move from the reset and then moving forward from there? Yeah. So anything you can do to uh, get out of your head and start doing something. So it could be as simple as going for a walk versus like laying on your bed in a fetal position. <laughs> 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 or just sitting there like staring or crying, right? Sometimes things are so scary or so hurtful or something happens that we're like, you're in this state of paralysis. So anything, uh, it could be doing something that's caring towards yourself, like a walk or, or a bath or, um, driving to your favorite location, uh, go just changing locations sometimes can really change what's happening in your head. Just going somewhere else. Uh, but there's bigger things you can do too. Like, uh, I love, 
I love using the five second rule to uh, <laughs> propel yourself to action. So our brain is trying to protect ourselves. We all have this, what, what we call like our lizard brain, which is like that primal evolutionary place of of trying to keep ourselves safe. So our brain doesn't know if like, it just knows fear. So it doesn't know the the level of fear. It just knows this is scary. I need to protect you. So it thinks like a saber toothed tiger is about to get you. So you need to stay safe and do the safe thing. So let's like stay in our little safe place. Uh, whereas it's literally just pushing send on an email. Like our life is not in danger. So that's what's happening in our brain. Our brain is trying to tell us stuff to keep us safe. So we have to take action before our brain can try to protect us. And so Mel Robbins, uh, talk, she has a book and she has a, a number of TED Talks where she talks about the five second rule where you literally say five, four, three, two, one. And then after you hit one, you do whatever the thing is that you're planning to do. So it might be push send on the email. It might be like pick up the phone and call the person. I know for uh, you know a lot of your audience, they're having to like talk to vendors and strategic partners and buyers and uh, distributors. And that those calls are probably really scary. Like Mina on, on my podcast, you shared that you called like 14 different manufacturers. Is that right? Did I get the number yeah, right? 12. 12. I made it more. Uh, <laughs> seemed like 14. <laughs> I'm sure it seemed like a hundred. <laughs> yeah. It did. The first few calls were, were kind of scary to do. And, uh, and so if you five, four, three, two, one it, that's a way to take action. And, uh, and I love that. I love that form of taking action. Uh, for me, a lot of times it is, I like to focus on things that are going to bring in revenue to take action on. So sometimes you may have a a list of a hundred things you should take action on. And then you don't know what to do because you've got a hundred things. So I help prioritize that for myself by thinking, what could I do right now to bring in revenue to my business? And, uh, and so it might be sending an invoice. It might be making a phone call. It might be, um, you know, uh, sending an email that's, you know, really well crafted and, uh, or might be recording a podcast and I'm scared to re- to record as well. So uh, anything you can do to take action, uh, that's that's what you want to do. And you have to figure out the things that are easiest for you to take action on. So we all have our things that are harder and easier. And there's something about, if you think about like a ball rolling down a hill, it starts off kind of slow and then it gets momentum as it gets farther down the hill. Taking little bits of action creates that momentum in what you're doing and helps you kind of bypass uh, those negative thoughts in your head. Mina and I like to, we actually both have realized that we like to clean up our house because we have control over it and it's an, it's an immediate, it's something we can do. And then there's a result. Um, We also tell people to do low effort, high impact stuff. And then when you're feeling really low, you need to do low effort, low impact, because those are like the way easiest stuff until you can get to the high impact stuff. Then it just helps to move you forward. I would say for the house stuff, because I I know a lot of uh, women that like to do this, I would just give yourself maybe a timeline because you don't want to lose a whole day like organizing because I'm a perfectionist. So if I'm going to organize something, it's going to be perfect and amazing. So you, I have to actually keep myself from organizing things during most work days or I will lose an entire day. Uh, like right now, my, uh, my, my kids' toys are an incredible mess. It really is like at least uh, a two-hour project. Uh, but if I get going on it, it will be like six hours. So I've just decided that has to stay there. But I can tidy up my office, which is where I'm sitting. And so that's what I was doing before we got on this call. Um, I was tidying up just because that, like you said, it makes you feel good to kind of accomplish something. Small goals. So let's talk about that because something that Mina and I were talking about. One of the things that we're attracted to with the Biz Chicks community and Biz Chicks uh, podcast, and I think something that you've done for us personally is that you've created a safe place for women entrepreneurs, highly successful female entrepreneurs to be able to figure out how to balance, right? So if we're going to talk about mindset, there's obviously imposter syndrome and all of that within your business. But I think there's also you know, this, there's a guilt that goes between, do you leave your house a mess? Do you leave your kids toys all over the floor? Are you available to cook dinner? Do you pick your kids up? So one thing that you shared with me early on in um, working with you was you asked me how many days were my kids in preschool and could I put them in preschool more? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Hmm, I had never thought about that because I always felt like I had to balance how many days were they staying late? How many days did I have to have them back? And the one thing that you said to me, it was about quality, not um, the quantity of time that I spent. So 
by spend if I pick them up at five and I have that till bedtime and I'm really involved with them then. So I think, and I think, Mina, you probably have something to say to this too, but I think that's something that in a, even in a mindset way, that's not even necessarily in this book entirely. It's that balance that we were talking about at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've done is give women permission to do what they need to do to run their business and to let go of some of that mom guilt. Uh, usually I find it's something we're putting on ourselves and not, and we, we may be in community where that's part of it as well, but a lot of times it's more what we're putting on ourselves. What I see happening is women trying to take care of small children and run their business at the same time from the same, all from all, all together. Right. And so what, what ends up happening is you don't do anything well during those moments, right? Because little children need a lot of attention and a lot of structure and your business needs a lot of attention and a lot of structure and they cannot both be done simultaneously. So I, I'm, I'm in a few Facebook groups and I'm, you know, I remember my own experience and my kids right now are four, six and 16. So I've kind of run the gamut and, um, I'm, you know, I have a daughter that's a junior in high school and a preschooler and an elementary school student. So I can relate to almost every level of mom. Right. (laughs) But when my kids were really little, you know, I can't, um, concentrate on like building a sales page or writing, uh, an email to a, a, a person that's interested in working with me while my kids are sitting there, right. They're going to keep interrupting me. And so that's why I think we need to give ourselves permission to set everybody up for success. So if we can have our kids in more childcare and give ourselves permission to that, that's okay. And then when they're present to, do what we can to be present. And it's hard, right? Because we're not stopping thinking about our business. And usually when we're doing our business, we're not necessarily stopping thinking about our kids. Uh, But I think uh, if you can afford it to put, I always say, get as much help as you can afford. And that could be childcare, that could be um, housekeeping help, house cleaning help, Uh, that could be help with errands, it could be help carpooling, uh, to get as much help as you can afford. And that works with you and your family and your family structure. You know, you and your partner have to decide what is best for you and your children. And every child's different. Every family structure is different. I remember at the time, Jacqueline, you had, you know, this large team of people you were managing. And uh, it was almost physic it was like humanly impossible to accomplish what you were trying to accomplish with small children underfoot. And so I don't think at the time it was working for any of you uh, to try to do all that together. And you were ending up working really late into the night and then getting up with them super early. So your sleep, you know, we're not sleeping. Uh, I mean, lack of sleep is a form of torture and war. So <laughs> I prioritize sleep. And when you have small children, your sleep's getting interrupted anyway. So we need to like set ourselves up for success. Honestly, it's different to run my business right now when my child, my youngest is four versus an infant. So like when I start, I started the podcast, I was pregnant with Jet. And so that whole first year, guess how much money I made? I mean, I think you guys know this. I made nothing. I made zero dollars, but I, I produced... 150 podcast episodes. I released 150 podcast episodes. And you uh, created a human. <laughs> I created a human. All those things happened in 2014, but I couldn't do it. And I was also running another business with my husband. So there was like way too many things happening. And even that next year, I actually was going through uh, my 2016 uh, calendar this year and I did not have full time childcare. At the end of 2016, I got full time. Co- Childcare, and that's when my business took off because I could not. I needed like every day to work on this business to get it where I wanted it to go and my goals and what my family needed it to be as well. So that's very hard for me. I was actually a stay at home mom with my daughter Aurora for the first few years of her life, and I like to spend a lot of time with my my little ones when my kids when they're really little. And I love the baby stage, so I'm so glad I had like that first year of Jet's life. You know, really a lot of time with him. Uh, but he he started going to preschool every day when he was two. So that was that was a big shift for me and how I had parented in the past. Uh, it worked for for him. It worked for our family, and it's 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 worked out. He's, he's fine. Uh, so, but I hear a lot of women have a lot of guilt, like, um, about that. And I have guilt too, right? I'm not saying that I don't walk around without any guilt, but 
We all have mom guilt and we just have to manage that. It helps that I have an older daughter. So like who can articulate things to me and tell me and also the things that she remembers and doesn't remember. Like I did so many play dates with her, you know, when I was like more a stay at home mom and she doesn't even really remember any of them. Right. We go to <laughs> the she remembers like little pieces of them. And, um, and you know, like I would, we would get on each other's nerves being together all day. So She's so proud of this business and uh, where it's gone. And uh, she's, she just is really, she understands that I'm not the mom that's in charge of everything for her choir and her dance team. I'm not hosting the tailgate parties. I'm doing like minimum viable school mom. And she understands that and she's totally supportive of it. So it's fun to also have like to hear, you know, she's almost an adult, uh, her perspective. And so I feel really good about the decisions I've made. And you show up like you show up for them. You know, you've, you've been able to build your business in a way that you get to show up at the things that are important. I like Um, to do, I think they're, what are they, what did you call that Mina? They're low effort, high impact. mm -hmm. That's my volunteer goal. (laughs) Low, low energy, high impact. So I love effort. I like to do field trips. Because uh, be high impact, low, high impact, <laughs> low effort. Is that what we called uh, it? Low effort. low effort. So field trips, that's like my hashtag advanced parenting tip. Um, and then I'm actually going today to help at, I, I don't volunteer very often, but I block, I know in December there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. And so I've blocked off a few. I just did a few things last week for my daughter's choir. They had this big festival that they put on. And then I'm actually helping build musical instruments in first grade a little later today. That sounds fun. That yeah. sounds fun. So tell us about, um, since you work with so many entrepreneurs and I know you work with product entrepreneurs as well, is there anything that you see rising up for product-based entrepreneurs in terms of mindset? That's a good question. I think that, let me go through some different different scenarios. I feel like they're so similar across the board. I don't know if there's anything s- specific to product entrepreneurs. I think that the the financial investment is so much bigger for a product entrepreneur versus a service-based entrepreneur. Like I could decide I want to offer a new service tomorrow and put it on my website. I have no investment. But as a product entrepreneur, if you want to uh, offer a new product or new, you know, even if you're just starting out or add a product line, you're investing some serious cash and you don't know if you're going to get it back. So I feel like the money mindset uh, comes into place for people more. And to me, the value would be in uh, really understanding, you know, what the market is telling you and what the financials will be, you know, at different levels of success, like a, a good, better, best scenario versus like <laughs> when I would like with, for our software business, which I, I keep talking about, but I haven't shared that we actually closed that business. So that was a business we invested a lot of money in like multiple six figures in that business. And we have shut it down. So I feel like I relate to investing a lot in a business and, and choosing to go a different direction. So we, we chose to focus our time and energy and finances on this business because of the momentum it had. But uh, as a product entrepreneur, really you've got to understand your inventory and so I think also what I see with product entrepreneurs is you guys are so creative. So you get a little bored with certain products, even though they're the product that's doing well. Like it's, it really needs your more, if you put just a tiny bit of, of time and energy into this one product that the market's loving, but you're kind of bored because you're creative and you want to create. So I think that there's something there in terms of like holding back on some of your creativity to keep the business moving forward and finding like those right times and places to put that creativity. But it's not always in like tons of new products and things. So uh, I I think there's something about self-control in there, which isn't necessarily um, in the mindset issue. It's more of like a virtue, right? Uh, But yeah, I think I think I would say money mindset and probably fear of failure. You know, it's usually pretty, um, it's very public when you have a product, right? In order to sell it, you've got to put it out there to the masses. Whereas for a service-based business, like I can say I'm going to launch a mastermind and um, do you know if I filled it or not? Probably not. Um, or I'm going to, I have coaching openings. Do you know if I filled them or not? No. But basically we're all going to know if your product business isn't successful because you're either going to make it or you're not. So I there's, it's the most complicated business to have. It's the hard, I say it's the hardest 
to have, or, you know, you could have a local service-based business, a local business, you could have a product business or an online business. Product is the most, the most challenging. There's the most challenging and the biggest financial investment. If I could do a ding, 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 when you hit that nail on the head. (laughs) (laughs) What about, um, (laughs) yeah, but the shiny object syndrome a bit for product entrepreneurs. So it's always about, like you said, what's next instead of digging deeper into what's working right now for them. And so oftentimes, you know, for me in fashion, clients will be like, I'm doing a clothing line and I'm going to launch a kid's line and I'm going to launch a men's line. And it's like, hold on what's selling because if you streamline that process and that does really well, it makes it easier to jump to that next thing. And so we always say like, come up with iterations of your best selling product versus all the other ideas because development costs money, right? So you're going to keep spending, like you said, you could start a mastermind tomorrow, just change up your website, talk about it. And then that's great. But you have to spend money on developing, sampling, trying it out, photo shoots, getting it up, and then hoping someone's going to sell it. So hoping. It's really hard when you have a lot of ideas. I think all three of us have a lot of ideas all the time. And, uh, even for my service-based business, you know, I have a lot of ideas and I hold them back because I want, I'm more focused on the success of the business than my new ideas coming out. And I find ways to try them out and to have, you know, to have, you know, my creativity be out there. Uh, but, we have to watch when we have to do more of what's working. That's the best advice I've had. Uh, I, you know, I had it for my podcast. Uh, a, a mentor shared that to me. I, he was like an industry mentor and I had a chance to talk to him in person. He was speaking at an event and, and I said, do you have any recommendations of how I can grow my audience? And he's like, well, what is your most downloaded episode? And I told him, he's like, do more of that. Do more of what that. And I was like, well, that's so simple. <laughs> that creates complexity. So volume can create complexity in your business. Adding new product lines creates complexity. Creating a new business adds complexity. And for those of us that are creative, we don't usually think through all of the consequences of that, the impact of that on us and the business and the finances. And so it's good to have, you know, like you guys have masterminds, you guys have accountability partners, you have your Facebook group to check in like, okay, I have this idea, like what would it take to implement it? <laughs> Instead of just like staying at the top line and go, Ooh, fine, let's do it. Uh, to like, do I have the time for this? And, um, I think you guys shared on an episode that you uh, recommend people take their Fridays to do yeah. that. And like, okay, let me try out. This is my play time for my, my idea, but Monday through Thursday is for getting the work done. What's up next for you for this coming year? The biggest thing for us and our team is Biz Chicks Live. That is, and I feel like we're just recovering from it still <laughs> a month ago. I was telling my daughter, she was asking me about something. I forgot to do something for it. And I'm like, well, you know, like I'm still like just recovering from Biz Chicks Live. She's like, mom, it was a month ago. Let's get it. <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> love teenagers. Yay. Move on. <laughs> your plate. I rolls. Yeah. A month ago. That is a huge uh, endeavor for us fi- financially and uh, in terms of just the effort and all the moving parts. And going into the third year of it, we're really excited to to hone that in a little bit. Uh, the other things are our high-level masterminds. So we have a mastermind for women that are multi-six-figure and seven-figure, and that has four retreats associated with it. So adding anything in person adds a lot of work and complexity and even just like communication with our clients because they have a lot of questions and some people have more questions than others. And even though we'll create like FAQs for people, there's always things we didn't think about. And then starting to think of another book. Talking about this, it's like you're planning a three-day wedding plus all the bachelorettes and bridal (laughs) showers and everything up to it. It is like a wedding every year and then like a family. It's becoming like a family reunion, which is really fun. And people are inviting their own clients. I know you guys brought a bunch of product bosses, which was so fun. And, uh, you guys were right. Like I, my memories from the event include both of your faces and your product boss table, because there was like this table of product entrepreneurs all sitting like front and center. You guys were ready to go, ready to learn. You know what's so funny is that we put our bags down and didn't realize the other people that were sitting there. And it happened to be the product bosses (laughs) that we put our bags down by. So the universe was like, you know what? We're putting all the product people together. Or they were tracking you guys. Yeah. (laughs) Where are they sitting? We want to sit near them. (laughs) I want to sit by them. Okay. Well, I don't know if that happened or not, but (laughs) sitting front and center. I got pulled up on stage. (laughs) 
<laughs> yep. I brought Jacqueline on stage. You're so, <laughs> thank you for participating. You're welcome. I actually, someone was listening to your podcast. Like, do you know that you were on, that you had done your, um, thing and it was on, uh, your inner mean girl. And so that's also in this book. And, and you talk about it a lot, like silencing your inner mean girl. And I always say, if I do a, like a solo episode or I'm on Facebook, I'm just Jack, kind of like Jack 2000, you know, Will and Grace call back. But we talked about how like the mean girl, the one that's in, in your head saying mean things is Jackie. Jackie. No, no offense, any Jackie's listening. <laughs> it just happens to be for you. Yeah. And then Jack and then Jacqueline, which is so funny because at the end of your event, someone raised their hand and they're like, I figured out my inner mean girl name too. And it was Jackie. <laughs> Oh, that's cute. It's like, oh, good. So, um, so Natalie, we like to wrap up our interviews with some fun questions. If you've listened, I have listened. Do okay. You know so you kind of know what's probably coming at you. So it's sort of a rapid fire question and answer. I'm trying to be brief. I have, as you can see, I struggle with that. No, don't <laughs> worry. It's fun when you, um, when like people are like, I don't drink coffee, but I drink da, 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 da. So, um, so the first question is, what is your coffee order? Uh, well, I prefer to drink coffee at home because our coffee is the best. <laughs> we drink organic Ethiopian coffee that we grind at home and we found a great source of it on Amazon. So we make that and I put half and half and honey in my coffee. It's delicious. It has to be piping hot. So um, do you have to rewarm that like 30 times? <laughs> Well, I, this is what drives my husband crazy because he doesn't like to waste things. I will just, if I get half a cup, so I like to fill it up all the way and then I will drink about half of it and I pour it out and I start over. Oh. And he gets very frustrated with me. Perhaps so. you can leave the second half for him to drink then. You would if I would. Like he probably would like to catch it all. Um, <laughs> he's, learned, he's just, I think he's learned to let it go. And, uh, but he's, you know, I'm just like, this is what I do. I make a full pot and then this is, this is how I drink my coffee. Yeah. And then why I not? Up when it gets low. And now that Aurora, you know, Aurora has been sipping my coffee for years, apparently. I didn't realize this. She's like, oh yeah, since I was little, I would always take a sip of your coffee and it, it's sweet, you know, so it tastes good. Uh, so she is a coffee drinker now. So we have three coffee drinkers in the house. We were like fighting over the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So you're cleaning up your desk, but what is the favorite thing on your desk? Okay. Well, there's several things here. Um, this is kind of fun. This is um, a homemade like sparkler thing. I, so it's a, uh, for we're, we're on video, some people are watching on video, but I'll just share what it is. It's a, um, like a plastic bottle with a cap and it has uh, glitter inside and water. And it's kind of like a sensory activity for little kids, but I like it too. And so sometimes I just like, you know, even like during this interview, I might have been shaking it. It just like makes me happy. And it's, it's, um, it's gold, gold sparkles in there. So I think we made it as a gift to like a homemade DIY present a few years ago for the kids. And I think I'm the one that liked it the most. So I decided to keep it on my desk. Yeah. I, I love actually that. brought it to the hotel that. for Biz Chicks Live as I was like still like finalizing some things. And it just is like, it calms me to kind of look at the glitter. So sometimes I travel with it. It's your lovey. So cute. <laughs> <I love you. laughs> Okay. So finish this sentence. When I pick up my phone, I uh, check my email. And then you wish you knew how to. I wish I knew how to sing. Really? I sing off key and I can hear it. <laughs> or I wish I knew how to not know I was off key. Does Aurora correct you? She just knows I'm like, off key. She just has accepted it. <laughs> so she will correct me though. If I try, sometimes I'll try to sing with her. She's like, what are you doing? Why, why are you singing now? Like, are you trying to harmonize with me? You're, you're not. You you're not. Listen. <laughs> and you have a whole business built off your voice, so you're fine. <laughs> it's true. Um, what was the last TV show you binge watched? Oh, oh, what was it called? The Kaminsky Method. Oh, is it good? Yeah, I liked it. Michael Douglas. It's about kind of these older actors that are uh, that are trying to like figure out their way in, in Hollywood and Hollywood's changed on them. So yeah, it was good. Really good. I, I love ensemble cast. So anything that has a good ensemble cast, um, I really, I really like that. It's like the guy version of Grace and Frankie or Frankie and Grace, whatever, yeah. right? Yes. Actors you love. And uh, I love Frankie and yeah, Grace, it's fun. Grace and Frankie, which are yeah, their I product classes. That one too. Yeah, they are product classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So if you had a business card, what would your title on your business card actually say? CEO. <laughs> of course. I'm laughing because I encourage all women to identify as a CEO and to be the leader of their company. So CEO, Great. chief executive officer. 
And then do you have an alter ego or stage persona? I wish I did. I don't. You can just get up on stage and be you and you're good. I'm just me. Yeah. Well, 30 power poses in and then you get up on the stage. (laughs) Power pose. If you haven't heard Amy Cuddy's TEDx talk, talk, I think it's C-U-D-D-Y on power posing. uh, That's what that's what I do. In fact, I we have a playlist from Biz Chicks Live on Spotify as I was listening to it this morning and the Wonder Woman song's on there. And so at Biz Chicks Live, we had um, all of our uh, former guests come up on stage and we did some power poses, which is really like trying to make your body as like, hold, take up more space. Like that gives you power in, in a room and communicating to other people, but even to yourself. And so standing in like, I like I do like the Wonder Woman pose where your feet are like um, spread apart and I'm doing it for you guys right now. Are you enjoying it? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Sure your hands are on your hips and you like have good posture and you look like Wonder Woman and you like feel the power. Yeah. So I do have to um, garner my power to get on stage and little totems and things I, they were, we were talking beforehand. Um, I have my big headphones, they're big black headphones and they cover my ears and I do not feel like I'm a real podcaster unless I have them on. So I have like some totems and things like that help me feel good. Uh, for some reason, when I speak, I like to wear heels. It makes me feel, I don't know, maybe taller and, and maybe it's part of that power feeling. Uh, so day to day, I don't walk around in heels, but if I'm going to speak, I would feel very, um, I would not feel as powerful if I didn't have my heels on. So I have these different totems and things that like help me be that person I'm supposed to be at that time. Amazing. Yeah. I remember getting up on stage because I've been a guest on your podcast and Kara was in front of me and I, she was doing the power pose, taking up room, but she didn't have her shoulders back. So I pulled her shoulders back and that's the key guys is pulling yeah. your shoulders back. Yeah. Cause you don't want to hunch. You got to get yeah. really, that's when you are eliciting confidence too, right? Mm-hmm. Having posture. Yeah. Right. It's awesome. Yeah. So um, it's like something to do before you're like going into a store and trying to get them to buy your product. You're like, take that pose and know you're going in. Yeah, yeah, or even if you're going to be on a podcast, who was power posing before this one? <laughs> and, and you just want to feel like I, it makes me energetic and feeling confident. Uh, anything you're going to do, like it could even be like, okay, I've got like some uh, calls to make that are terrifying me. You can do it in your house. Uh, teach your children. My daughter knows about it and she does it before. She, she taught her mock trial team. <laughs> Even the, oh my gosh, I love it. The mock trial team uh, do power posing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going to the next generation. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so Natalie, uh, last question. Uh, we've heard that entrepreneur years are like dog years. So you learn a lot very quickly. What would you tell baby Natalie in the beginning of her journey that you know now? What would you tell her? I would tell her to focus on revenue. And to, I I feel like when I was coming up as a new entrepreneur, I was learning about content and there was this, this theory that you should just create a bunch of content and the people will come to you. So I thought I would launch this podcast and all these people would listen and then I would get all these sponsors and that would be the business. Uh, That wasn't the business. And, uh, and, And I also would tell her to not be afraid to put her voice out there. So podcasting actually has helped me find my voice. I didn't know that I had all of this knowledge and mentorship to offer to women. And it was through that process of interviewing other women and realizing, you know, I kind of know what I'm talking about. And uh, so I guess I would tell baby Natalie from 2014, 2014 Natalie, past Natalie, that uh, you know a lot more than you know, than you think you do. And uh, to offer, offer your services to offer coaching and masterminds because I had that idea from the beginning uh, to offer those earlier than I did. So in 2015, a client told me, she said, this is mid 2015. She's like, Natalie, we we got on the call. She decided to sign up as a coaching client. She said, it's really hard to find out how to work with you. Like there was no work with me tab on my website. And I was like, whoo, okay. And it's because I was dealing with mindset issues around that, right? So I didn't want to make it. In product terms, that's like having a product, but no buy now or add to cart button. Like, you know? look, at it. <laughs> look at this beautiful thing you could maybe have if you can figure out how to get me to sell it to you. So, uh, yeah, just, I, you know, I, I, I think people look at me now and people that are in my community are like, Oh, Natalie's so confident. She's got this amazing business, all these things. But I have had every entrepreneur has the same struggles and I still have mindset issues. I still have scarcity feelings. I still have fear of failure, fear of success, fear of judgment. I still go through all these things. I, they don't stop. And so 
uh, we just have to keep, you know, working on ourselves and surrounding ourselves by like-minded women, which I'm so excited that you guys are uh, creating that for product entrepreneurs. Yeah, we, um, like we say all the time, we were inspired by the community you created and then just wanted to find more of a community for product entrepreneurs because like we say, the struggles that come up, like you said, they're different. They are different sometimes to mixing and being with other types of people. And there's other times where it's better to be with people that are just like you. And so you have to discern what's best for you at the time. Uh, but product businesses are their own beast, right? And, uh, you two are you two are who I recommend people go to for support. So well, thank you, Natalie Ekbell. We thank you so much. Nita <laughs> Jacqueline. Thank you. you do a lot, actually. <laughs> so um, so again, we are so honored that you are here. So tell our listeners how they can connect with you and how they can buy Reset Your Mindset. Oh, awesome. I was thinking uh, I would love to give everyone access to the videos from the book. So there were eight women interviewed. One is Jacqueline. Ooh, ooh. And- get access to those by going to bizchicks.com slash reset. And I spell chicks with an X. So it's B-I-Z-C-H-I-X.com slash R-E-S-E-T. And uh, you'll get access to uh, not only the eight interviews that we did, which are about 30 minutes each. And the bulk of them are not in the book, right? Because we can only, it's like two minutes are in the book uh, versus uh, the whole interview. So they're, they're really beautiful and, um, and, and fun, you know, fun and inspiring to watch. Uh, but also we are sharing the, uh, all the worksheets on mindset that were in the, as you are calling the Biz Chicks Bible, we internally call it our Biz Chicks <laughs> Uh, but we have a whole section on mindset, including like the what if protocol I was talking about. We have a worksheet on that. We have another worksheet on how to unpack your money mindset. So that whole section is available to anyone at bizchicks.com slash reset. And there's a link to buy the book on that page as well. Or if you go to uh, Amazon and uh, type in either my name, Natalie Ekdahl, or reset your mindset, it will come up. And we'll put those all in the show notes. So thank you so much again for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Natalie. We love you so much. <laughs> I adore you too. And I'm just like amazed because I'm sure you've shared before, but maybe not everyone knows. I introduced you to. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's been a lovely connection. And uh, I'm, I'm so inspired by you guys too and all you've done. And, uh, and it's just such an honor to know you and be in community with you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Natalie. Thank you. Hey there, still here? We want to invite you to our 2019 Mastermind, which starts in January. We've opened it up to three groups now to better serve our masterminders in startup, five-figure, and six-figure and above. We would love to have you in there to help transform your business into the product business of your dreams. Join other amazing product entrepreneurs for support, shortcuts, and real connection. Go to www.theproductboss.com mastermind for more information and to save your spot.